Hello, Chem 213 students, and welcome back for our third and final lecture this week about alpha proton chemistry. Uh, when we finished off last, we talked about two important reactions in which enolate intermediates in, uh, react with carbonyl groups as an, and doing a nucleophilic attack and ultimately produce compounds uh, uh, in the case of aldehydes and ketones producing uh, the alpha hydroxy or the uh, alpha beta uh, unsaturated products of the two after a nucleophilic attack we all um, referred to as the aldol condensation uh, we also talked about this same type of reaction but with esters ultimately uh, um, produce, uh, producing what's known as a Claisen condensation. So today uh, we're going to talk about our final reactions in, in the alpha position of carbonyls and also talk about a few strategies that you will use when using these synthetically. Uh, so the alpha position can be uh, alkylated when enolate is treated with an alkyl halide. Uh, to do this what we'll want to do is irre irreversibly produce the enolate ion so we're going to use uh, lithium diethyl amide and then treat this with a uh, treat the enolate ion here with a alkyl halide preferentially a, a methyl halide or a primary halide because uh, the subsequent enolate ion that's produced by treatment of the, the base uh, is then going to undergo a SN2 reaction. Remember, SN2 reactions involve a backside attack of the, the carbon that is attached to the leaving group, which in this case is the halide, uh, and thus we, there needs to be uh, not too much steric hindrance back here, uh, so we don't want too many big bulky groups for this SN2 reaction to occur. Uh, so as I said, typical SN2 reaction restrictions apply. So secondary and tertiary alkyl halides do not uh, do not favor the substitution. Instead, you'll get an elimination. And so if you do this uh, alkylation, you're going to want to do it with primary or methyl alkyl halides. <clears throat> the aldol reaction will also com compete with the alkylation, and that is why we're using a strong base. This is going to irreversibly produce our enolate ion. And, uh, and hopefully uh, lead to a greater percentage of the products of the, alkyl the alkylated products. Uh, regio selectivity can be an issue with unsymmetrical ketones because you can end up with two different potential enolates because there's two different alpha protons that can be deprotonated. And so uh, generally symmetrical ketones will want to be used for these reactions. Uh, so for example, uh, here, um, when it comes to the the uh, alkylation here uh, we have this unsymmetrical ketone here if it's treated with a base we have two alpha protons and i'm just going to draw them in here we have one alpha proton which i've drawn in red and then we have well two more really on the other hydrogen so the question is you know which one is going to be uh to be deprotonated um, we can end up with two different enolates uh, if we're doing things at a lower or at a higher temperature, the thermodynamically stable, more more thermodynamically stable enolate will be formed. Uh, that's going to be generally under normal conditions, uh, normal temperatures. We get this enolate where the double bond is on the more substituted carbon because this is more thermodynamically stable. Uh, however, we could get some of the uh, less thermodynamically stable. Uh, base here uh enolate ion uh, rather the enolate ion if uh we're doing this at a uh at a lower temperature where kinetic factors are more important because it, there's deprotonating here you can see that this is going to be a little bit more sterically hindered uh than this one and so uh this deprotonation will be kinetically favored however this deprotonation will be thermodynamically favored and give the more thermodynamically stable product so we can see that in this energy diagram here, uh, there is a greater kinetic barrier, so the activation energy here for the formation of the more substituted alkene in the enolate ion has a higher activation energy because it's a little bit harder to, uh, to get in here and deprotonate this carbon. But once you do, you get a more thermodynamically stable product. Uh, so at higher temperatures, you'll get this resulting enolate. 
However, at lower temperatures, not enough molecules will be able to reach the activation energy, so you'll get the less stable but more kinetically favored enolate at the less substituted position. Uh, so kinetic enolate is favored by irreversible conditions. So if we want to create the enolate right away and then it can't really go back and make the other enolate, the more thermodynamically stable, stable one, we'll use lithium diethylamide as the base and that will get us uh, the enolate here that will be at the less substituted position and so we can alkylate at the less substituted position. Uh, if we use sodium hydride, which is a little uh, weaker base here, um, a little bit more reversible uh, at room temperature here, also uh, giving us the access to the more thermodynamically favored products. So you can see here we use a very low temperature with a strong base to get us the kinetically favored product. We have a, a relatively strong base as well, but not as strong and higher temperatures to produce the more kinetically favored product where ultimately the, um, the alkylation occurs on the more substituted carbon. Um, and so we're going to be kind of going quick fire through a bunch of uh, other reactions here. Some of them will have um, some of them will have mechanisms. Some of them will not. Uh, another one that we refer to uh, uh, that another important synthetic reaction is the malonic ester synthesis. Uh, in this case, we convert an alkyl halide into a carboxylic acid with two additional carbons. Uh, the starting material here is going to be dimethylmalonate. And so dimethylmalonate is this molecule here. It's a diester, uh, diester here. And notice that this proton is positioned between two uh, carbonyl groups. So this is a pKa9 proton. Uh, we, can, we can pretty irre irreversibly uh, remove this with not, we don't have to have a hugely strong base. Uh, ethoxide would be the choice here, um, again, for the same reasons as before when we were working with esters, we don't want to have a replacement of the, uh, the alkoxy group here with whatever the base was by a nucleophilic substitution and a kicking off of the other group. So we want, we'll want to use a base that is equivalent, uh, in this case, ethoxide equivalent here to the eth ethyl groups, ethoxy groups on the diethylmalonate. Uh, this will give us a resonantly stabilized enolate ion uh, and that enolate ion can then go on and do a nucleophilic attack on the alkyl halide here. And so we have the attack here on the alkyl halide. Remember, this is an SN2 reaction. So we would want this alkyl halide uh, preferably to uh, be primary or methyl, right? Uh, alkyl halide. But then we can install that group here uh, and then... Um, Finally, uh, if we can make the diacid here by hydrolyzing uh, both ester groups here, uh, so we have the you know, nucleophilic attack by water uh, and then the deprotonation here. Um, so often, uh, one of the carboxylic acid groups will then be decarboxylated uh, with heat, as we saw in the carboxylic acid chapter, and uh, the result is that we end up with CO2 and the equivalent of one side here of this. So we have all of this, this other group leaves and uh, it leaves as CO2. So this whole part here is going to, to come off and essentially, so we'll see the mechanism in a moment, but essentially what's, what's happening with the atoms is these ones are gonna leave as CO2, this hydrogen will, will leave as well in an alternative way. Um, and then we'll get this group uh, that I'm oops that I'm going to circle in blue here uh, will be the group that we are ultimately interested in. The CO2 then leaves as well, driving this reaction forward. Uh, <clears throat> this the way that in which this occurs. You, you saw I mentioned this hydrogen here. Where does this hydrogen go? It's not in part of CO2. And where it goes here is that it ultimately ends up the hydrogen that's going to, to be on the OH group here. Uh, so we'll, let, let's take a look here. Uh, so we have this carbonyl group. This is the one on this side. So this is the one in the green. Uh, we end up with a, a uh, movement of the proton, essentially. The proton jumps over uh, to, this, to this carbon over here. Uh, 
and then uh, we have the breaking of this bond here and finally this sigma bond breaks right and so uh, so we can see here that where we're breaking is right here this is breaking right and see what happens here uh, so <clears throat> this is kind of flipped around but you can see that this whole group here is going to leave as co2 this is going to be the co2 and then this is going to be the oh group we can see it right here uh, and then we have another oh group and we have this this uh, double bond so the double bond is formed because these electrons these pi electrons from this sigma bond are now these electrons from this sigma bond are now the pi electrons here. We have an OH group right here. We have another group right here. And so this is an enol, uh, and this is going to go undergo the keto enol tautomerization. And so ultimately, remember, uh, the tautomerization involves the removal of this proton and the installation here. So essentially, during the tautomerization, the proton is going to go here. You'll no longer have a double bond here. Instead, uh, the, the double bond will be between this carbon and this oxygen. So ultimately, we get this product here. Uh, so overall, altogether, uh, a melonic ester synthesis here. Um, we have the treatment with a base that's going to deprotonate this. This uh, alpha carbon right here, alpha to both these carbonyl groups. In this, and then we'll treat with a primary alkyl halide. So this is a primary alkyl halide. It has this big group here, but it's primary right there. So the enolate ion is going to attack right here, which will attach this. Uh, finally, when we treat with H3O plus and heat, we get a uh, we get this uh, these series of tautomerizations, which ultimately gives us the carboxylic acid group there. Uh, and so just count, noting, noting the carbons here. So this whole group right here, I'm circling in the dark blue, that is this right here. And these are ultimately attached to this ester group, right? Uh, the attack occurs here. So that's like this right here. Uh, but this one is then uh, tautomerizes and ultimately produces the carboxylic acid. Um, Diethylmalonate can also be dialkylated here. Uh, so instead of attaching one group at this alpha carbon, we could attach a second. And so here we would attach the first one. And this would occur because there's a second proton here that can be deprotonated, right? So there's still a hydrogen here. So this can be deprotonated and produce for us another, uh, an, another enolate ion here, which can then do a nucleophilic attack again, an SN2, on the alkyl halide and produce a dialkylated uh, diethylmalonate as well. In, in this case, we all we have left is the carbonyl. We lose both of the, the ester groups because uh, recall that how that whole process goes, right? We end up losing the, the ester group here as a CO2. So we lose it twice as CO2, and then they're both gone. Uh, another ester synthesis here, uh, the aceto acetoacetic acid ester synthesis, it's analogous to the mal malonate, but instead of having, uh, as in the, in the malonate here, we had the uh, an, a diester, we had an ester over here as well. Here we simply have a carbon atom, uh, but we have the same types of uh, reaction apply here. We still have this, uh, you know, pKa9 protons here over at the alpha carbon and so these can be deprotonated you can have the nucleophilic attack on the primary alkyl halide here you can install the alkyl group in this case you're not going to get a carboxylic acid instead you're going to get a ketone uh, this group here not being an ester not being uh, converted to a carboxylic acid instead just remaining as the ketone same mechanism though no, otherwise the first steps um, so now, going back to aldol condensations, uh, remember that in aldol con condensations, uh, we ultimately, after we have produced the, the beta hydroxy ketone or aldehyde, uh, that in the presence of, of acid or base, uh, it, with any reasonable temperatures, will go, undergo um, 
a elimination to produce the alpha beta beta uh, unsaturated ketone or aldehyde. Um, so the acid, the alpha beta unsaturated carbonyls uh, have resonance have you know significant resonance here because we have the um, the conjugated pi bonds. And so you can see it here, double, single, double. And so we can draw several resonance structures. Uh, remember, we need to follow our resonance structure arrow pushing patterns from chapter two, same as before. The first one here is a pi bond between two atoms of differing electronegativity. And so those electrons can be treated as being on the oxygen. At that point, uh, this carbon here will have three bonds and no lone pairs, giving it a positive formal charge. The oxygen will have now three lone pairs and only one bond giving it a negative formal charge but at that point we have an allylic carbocation and so allylic carbocation is a one arrow resonance move and here at that point now this carbon will no longer have three bonds it will have four bonds again uh, but this carbon will have three bonds and no lone pairs so it will be positive formal charge and the reason why this is important is because this means that we have an electrophile on the uh, the beta carbon here and so that electrophile can uh, you know you can have a nucleophilic attack on that electrophile and then you can get additions in that way as well so um, <clears throat> notice that we're again yeah we're gonna have two electrophilic positions so not only can we have an elect uh, a nucleophilic attack on the carbonyl carbon as we've seen time and time again in these last several chapters we can also have a nucleophilic attack on uh, this beta carbon as well. So if we use a Grignard reagent as the nucleophile that will generally attack the carbonyl position, uh, really strong nucleophiles here, really strong bases, also really strong nucleophiles. So um, remember that in a Grignard, uh, essentially what we've got is we've got a carbanion here and then we have a cation with the magnesium but it's the carbanion that is the relevant component here and that's going to do the nucleophilic attack on the carbonyl and uh, ultimately that will produce an alkoxide ion we treat it with acid to protonate the alkoxide ion and we get the um, we get an alcohol here and added carbon atoms over there uh, if we use a gilman reagent instead we can that that our group will attack at the uh, the beta carbon here and we'll get a 1,4 addition instead we still have the same issues where we've got to uh, protonate at the end uh, this time we'll be protonating a, uh, a carbon ion so uh, and now we, we can draw this in a few different ways I said protonating the carbon ion that's effectively what occurs but we can also draw it in a different way uh, with with the um, which is really two ways of representing the same thing. Uh, but we have the nucleophilic attack of uh, the Gilman reagent nucleophile, uh, the carbanion, on the beta carbon. Uh, and now we're doing a few resonance arrows tricks here, okay? Uh, two of them in succession. Number one, and I'm going to draw these in blue. Number one, we're doing a pi bond between atoms of differing electronegativity, uh, which essentially puts a positive formal charge here uh, and then we're doing an allylic positive formal charge so the same resonance arrows we drew before we're just drawing them all at once uh, and and then the nucleophile here is attacking here where there would be a positive formal charge uh, ultimately we need to protonate whether we call it protonating the carbon or protonating the oxygen either way we're going to have a negative formal charge and so we're going to have to protonate uh, that and and get it to a neutral charge and so we'll treat with acid afterwards and we protonate it and we get the enol and of course enols can undergo the keto enol tautomerization and um, <clears throat> and so in terms of the the keto enol tautomerization here uh, the ketone is going to be the far more uh, stabilized product here and so again re essentially remember in the tautomerization what occurs is this hydrogen goes from here and instead uh, moves over right and ends up over here uh, moves over to the neighboring carbon <clears throat> uh, stronger nucleophiles will tend towards the one two addition so that's what we saw with the Grignard reagent 
Uh, the weaker nucleophiles, like the Gilman reagent, tended towards a 1,4 addition. Uh, oftentimes, of course, you're going to get a mixture of products. Uh, if you have a stabilized enolate, uh, then it's going to really favor the 1,4 addition. Uh, so, for example, here, uh, in this case, we have uh, uh, this is going to be the the uh, the essentially enolate, the conjugated enolate that's going to get attacked. We're going to have a deprotonation. For the deprotonation here of this um, dicarbonyl, we don't need a super strong gaze. Again, these are much more acidic due to the presence of the dicarbonyl resonantly stabilizing the conjugate base. Uh, so we deprotonate here. Um, I'm just going to say, okay, we're going to, we have two hydrogens, right? We're going to pluck off one. The OH is going to go grab it. And that's going to leave us with a negative formal charge here. And then, uh, so I'll just erase that and go right to the to the meat of this here, is that now we end up with a carbanion. A carbanion right here. Uh, and that is going to be our nucleophile. That nucleophile is going to go for the 1,4 attack here, the beta carbon attack. And we'll have our two resonance arrows as we had before. And finally, we can see that it attacked at the beta carbon, the beta carbon being right here. Right? And so that's where we got the addition right here. And then ult uh, uh, ultimately, we get the, ad the addition product right here at that second carbon. Finally, we protonate in the end and, uh, and get our product. Uh, so the stabilized enolates, uh, like the ones we saw here, give us 1,4 addition exclusively. The conjugate 1,4 addition is referred to as the Michael reaction. And the Michael donor is a nucleophile that, that does the conjugate addition. The Michael acceptor is the alpha-beta unsaturated carbonyl. So in this case, the, uh, the Michael donor is the diketone here. The Michael acceptor is the alpha-beta unsaturated carbonyl right here. And we ultimately get um, this Michael reaction. So uh, Michael donors will give exclusively one for addition. Uh, so you, let's let's break down what what these are. Um, you shouldn't memorize a table like this. You should instead understand why uh, it is that way. So we have a, a, a couple of dicarbonyls, uh, diester, di, diketone that can be easily deprotonated here at the alpha, the double alpha carbons. Uh, we can have a mixture, so we have ketone ester here, same type of deal. Um, we have the, the Gilman reagent, weak nucleophile, and then we have this, um, this nitrile and this NO2, and we're going to see why this nitro and the nitrile are, are decent uh, Michael donors here. Uh, but notice that these are both going to be um, anions that are resonantly stabilized here. <clears throat> Michael acceptors. You can see these are the uh, beta beta carbons here in conjugated pi bond systems. These are all conjugated pi bond systems here, uh, all double, single, like uh, you know, pi bond, single bond, pi bonds, pi bonds, single bond. There's pi bonds in here and so forth. Uh, because oh, this is a little small. Sorry, guys. I didn't realize that. that a little bigger there we go uh, so whoops because the stabilized enolates do not give a high yielding Michael additions uh, there is another uh, alternative synthesis and this is the one that goes through an enamine uh, and so here this is similar to what we saw in chapter 19 uh, for reactions of ketones uh, so we're going to have an amine here that amine can uh, it has a, electrons here it can do a nucleophilic attack on the carbonyl ultimately this produces for us the enamine as we had seen before in chapter 19 uh, so enamines are are analogous to enolates uh, because they also have their their resonance stabilizations and a carbon that behaves as a nucleophile so in the enolates here, we have the negative formal charge oxygen 
uh, that is adjacent to this pi, pi bond here. And so essentially we have uh, an arrow pushing pattern here that is our allylic lone pair, right? Allylic lone pair. So this lone pair is one bond away from this double bond. And so we can do the two arrow resonance uh, movement here. And we have a enolate ion where we have the carbonyl, uh, the carbon ion uh, resonant form here. Likewise, again, in this situation, we have a delocalized um, allylic lone pair. And so we can have that two arrow resonance arrows here uh, pattern. And we end up with a a, uh, a carbon ion again and the the but the enamine here is going to be less nucleophilic and so uh, it's going to behave better in this reaction um, and it will be the Michael donor um, so remember the, the less the more nucleophilic went for the one two additions but we're trying to do the one four addition so we wanted to a little bit weaker nucleophiles that favor the one four addition uh, so we'll have uh, this this imine behaving as a uh, as a so the the enamine is less nucleophilic. It's going to behave as a Michael donor, and uh, we'll have a Michael acceptor, which is again going to have a uh, conjugated pi bond system and making the the beta carbon a nucleophilic. And so we'll have a nucleophilic attack on that beta carbon. We'll have two resonance arrows. One that produces our carbocation here and then we have uh, all uh, allylic carbocation and so those are two resonance arrows here uh, and in the end we get an aminium ion and a enolate uh, notice that this is oxygen is now going to have three lone pairs and it's going to have one bond so it will have a negative formal charge these pi electrons are now here on this bond uh, so we have this pi bond here uh, for the nitrogen, it's making four bonds, and it has no lone pairs. And so it's an, a positive ion here, a so-called aminium ion. Uh, finally, as we saw in Chapter 19, again, if we treat with an acid, uh, we can convert that aminium ion to a ketone, and ultimately we produce uh, our product of our my Michael addition, this diketone. So, uh, or sorry, the, the stor stork to be specific <laughs> the modified michael edition of uh, the stork synthesis and so all putting it all together uh, we treat with a dialkyl amine uh, that's going to produce for us an enamine that enamine will then uh, behave as a michael donor and it will do a nucleophilic attack on the beta carbon of the michael acceptor which is identified by its uh, conjugated pi bonds here with the carbonyl and the, and the pi bond between the two carbons. Uh, ultimately, we treat with acid to convert the enamine back to a ketone, as we saw in chapter 19. Uh, another synthetically useful reaction is the so-called Robinson annulation. Uh, annulation means, uh, it's from the Latin annulus, meaning ring. So Robinson annulation is a, a reaction that's going to create rings. Uh, so it's an intramolecular, um, uh, aldol, it's a Michael addition followed by an intramolecular aldol condensation. So let's look at the way that works here. Uh, so we're going to start by treating with hydroxide. Whoops. We're going to start by treating with hydroxide. And so we have this hydrogen here. We have hydroxide. Uh, the first step is going to be the formation of <clears throat> the enolate ion. The enolate ion, as we've seen many times before in this chapter already, is uh, formed by the deprotonation of the alpha, alpha carbon. Uh, that's going to give us, and I'm just going to write it, I'm going to erase what I've got here and write it directly on here. Now we've got our Michael donor, um, which is the carbon ion right here it's got a negative formal charge uh, and so we have our michael acceptor here with the conjugated uh, carbon carbon double bond with the carbonyl and so now we're going to have a nucleophilic attack on the beta carbon here uh, followed by the resonance arrows that we saw previously and so what that means now is 
that um, uh, we have now this this one attached right here okay and um, we have this carbonyl when we after we finish the Michael addition uh, we end up with protonating everything we don't have the double bond there anymore uh, ultimately though we can treat with NOH again which will deprotonate right here and produce for us a carbonyl which, which can then do the uh, the nucleophilic attack here and ultimately we have the aldol condensation we have the elimination of water so we'll have an intermediate here uh, remember we we're gonna usually skip right through this intermediate uh, but just for the sake of clarity here um, uh, whoops I should have drawn the product of that not copied it exactly uh, so when this bond is created here uh, we create so we're gonna have in our ring we're gonna have one two three four five six carbons so we have one two three four five six one one two three four five six oops I'm better draw that a little bit better one two oops I'm missing one there it is let's erase that again let's count those carbons again notice that process notice is we're adding a lot of carbon atoms in this chapter so you might have noticed that relative to previous ones I'm really counting my carbons a lot a lot more right uh, so we have this one one two three so that's the one I missed three and then on the fourth one we're gonna have this oxygen and then we'll have this last one and that's gonna be connected to this first one and then this one will be a alkoxide ion this one is ultimately protonated and then we have an elimination and that elimination produces a double bond right here uh, finalizing that aldol condensation and so this is referred to as the Robinson annulation so now what we've seen is we've seen a variety of reactions in this uh, especially in this lecture we saw a variety of useful synthetic reactions and a lot of these reactions are new reactions that form carbon-carbon bonds and so these are going to be new strategies for when you have to add carbon atoms so remember your general strategy when in synthesis number one look and say do I have any more carbon atoms and that's going to if you do you're you're going to have a step that involves adding more carbon atoms uh, what functional group changes do I have um, and notice that a lot of these reactions uh, you know we we've been producing a variety of useful functional groups whether they be uh, uh, a alpha uh, alpha hydro or beta hydroxy group or an alpha beta unsaturation with the carbonyl uh, so look for those patterns look for that alpha beta unsaturation and see will one of these synthetic steps get that for me uh, we had so we have these new reactions here that are adding more carbon carbon double bonds aldol reactions producing again the beta hydroxy or condensation producing alda, alpha beta uh, alpha beta unsaturated ketones and aldehydes the Claisen condensation here between the um, between the ester groups uh, the stork enamine synthesis or Michael reactions uh, the positions in the final functional group are what you're going to want to be looking for right uh, if you if you have a carbonyl group left and you have these other alkene or alcohol functional groups left over or in the case of the Claisen uh, the other reactions here like the Claisen the the um, carboxylic acid group uh, those are something to watch out for so for example here if you're doing if you have a reaction that ultimately produces a 1,5 dicarbonyl compound those are the products of a stork enamine synthesis so you should be looking out for one of those 1,5 dicarbonyls that tells you that the stork enamine synthesis may be useful there uh, for the aldol and the claisen you're gonna have 1,3 difunctional compounds so if you're doing an aldol an aldol reaction with hydroxide you'll just get an aldol reaction not a condensation and you'll have the beta hydroxy carbonyl here a hydroxyl group on the third carbon relative to the carbonyl one two three if um, you're doing this uh, if you're doing a a uh, a Claisen reaction 
uh, you're going to end up with a 1,3 carbonyl here. Uh, so that's something to look, to look out for. Uh, the 1,3 the ester and the ketone here. Okay. Uh, we learned two ways to add more alkyl groups. So if you're simply al adding alkyl groups and the functional groups aren't changing, you can consider uh, you can consider a alkylation uh, using, for example, the Gilman reagent and a primary or methyl alkyl halide. So here we've used the Gilman reagent uh, to produce the the, uh, the enolate ion, and then we have the addition here of uh, an ethyl group here. So notice we've added two groups. The, uh, the Gilman reagent here had it added the ethyl group into the beta position um, for one four addition. And then that was followed up by methyl iodide here, uh, which, which involved a nucleophilic attack on the uh, an SN2 reaction here with the deprotonated uh, car um, carbanion here. Uh, to produce the methyl substituent right here. So if you're having two uh, alkyl groups on the alpha and the beta position uh, relative to a carbonyl, that tells you you're going to want to do a, um, an alkylation reaction. Um, the alpha halogenation here, a reaction of ketones. So if you end up with a halogenation right at the alpha position, uh, you'll want to perform the alpha halogenation here with the protonation of the carbonyl and the reaction uh, with, with the bromine. Um, and finally, uh, the for production of carbo carboxylic acids here uh, for the, the alpha halogenation of carboxylic acids, you'd use the held bohard zelinsky reaction, which involves treatment of Br2 with PBr3 uh, to to essentially activate this, which ultimately leaves, if you recall the mechanism. And then finally, uh, we reprotonate the, um, the carboxyl group that's produced. Uh, we can have the halo form reaction. So in the halo form reaction, we have a alpha halogenation followed up by uh, this oxidation, which produces for us a, um, so it takes a ketone and, and or an aldehyde here, a ketone, and produces for us a carboxylic acid, the halo form reaction. Um, for the aldol condensations, again, when you're getting a product here that has an alpha beta one unsaturated uh, aldehyde, you're going to want to do an aldol condensation. Uh, remember that for that, you'll use the stronger bases such as lithium, like LDA, um, LDA, lithium diisopropylamine. If you want aldol or addition, you use a, a um, weaker base such as sodium hydroxide. Um, for the cross aldol condensation, remember that you have to be careful about this. Uh, make sure that you one of your reactants either is treated with LDA to make it a, 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 a stable enolate ion, or you use formaldehyde or benzaldehyde to have a one of your carbonyls with no alpha protons on it. Uh, and that will ultimately produce an aldo, aldo condensation, giving us a carbon-carbon double bond here uh, at the beta position. So we end up with a carbon-carbon double bond. Uh, we can have intramolecular aldo condensation. So if you're starting with a dicarbonyl or can get to dicarbonyl and you're getting a ring with a double bond, you'll want to consider the intramolecular aldol condensation. Um, Claisen condensation here, if you're going to end up with a dicarbonyl here, uh, ester and a carbonyl at the beta position, that's going to be where you're going to want to use a Claisen condensation. Uh, if, again, you're having um, a 1, 2, 3, say beta carbonyl uh, and an ester in a ring, uh, this is going to be an intramole intramolecular Claisen condensation, so-called Dieckmann cyclization. Uh, like the cross-aldol condensations, you can have cross-Claisen condensations. And again, those cross-Claisen condensations are going to produce for us a 1,3 dicarbonyl, uh, one being an ester here and the other being a ketone or an aldehyde. Uh, alkylation, uh, when you're thinking about alkylation and on an asymmetrical carbonyl, you'll want to think about the way in which you do it. 
if you want it to be the alkylation to occur at the less substituted carbon, you're going to have to go with the kinetically favored product, meaning uh, do this with a strong base, low temperatures, uh, and treat with the alkyl halide to do the SN2 reactions. If you want the alkylation to occur at the more substituted carbon, uh, or you're, you're going to use a stronger base. You're going to, here you're going to use the weaker base, rather. I said stronger here. Here, uh, here you're going to use a stronger base. Here you're going to use a weaker base, sodium hydroxide, at a higher temperature. Uh, and, and then you're going to treat with your alkyl halide. That will allow for the more thermodynamically favored um, intermediate here and ultimately producing the more substituted alkyl halide. Uh, we also had the melonic ester synthesis here. Uh, the melonic ester synthesis actually synthesizes a carboxylic acid from a uh, melonic, the melonic ester. Uh, so if you're producing a carboxylic acid, uh, this is an option here. Uh, the acetoacetic acid the synthesis is uh, is somewhat similar. Instead, the uh, the um, the ester group here is replaced with a alkyl group and you have the carbonyl. So notice again here we end up losing this ester group and we get this, this carbonyl group, but the, um, the ethoxy group is kicked off and replaced with a hydroxyl group. Here we simply uh, replace the entire ester group with an uh, alkyl group. Um, Finally, with Michael additions, so these are going to involve the alkylation at the beta position here. And so we'll use the Gilman reagent, R2CLI, uh, and then ultimately have an acid workup to protonate uh, the alkoxide that is produced as an intermediate. We can also have a Michael addition here if we have an attack of a dicarbonyl, uh, which is deprotonated by a you know, moderately strong base, doesn't have to be super strong, just hydroxide is fine. Uh, and then we have an attack on the beta position, and ultimately that uh, attaches the rest of the group here. Um, the stork enamine synthesis, this one will produce for us from, we don't, we don't need a dicarbonyl, a single carbonyl will work. We essentially replace that carbonyl with this uh, enamine, uh, ultimately producing an enamine. That enamine also will have a carbanion as an intermediate, like an analogous to an enolate ion. We'll do a nucleophilic attack on the beta carbon on a conjugated enone here, and ultimately produce a uh, add the alkyl group here. In this case, we need the protons at the end again to uh, protonate. Uh, the, the ultimate product here. Finally, uh, we have last the Michael addition. So if you end up with a cyclic compound uh, with multiple carbonyls, one, can, one possible, uh, possible um, option here is to do the uh, Robinson annulation, which will be the deprotonation of the dicarbonyl here. Uh, at the alpha position and a uh, making it the Michael donor and an attack on the Michael acceptor. Uh, finally, you have an intramolecular uh, aldol condensation that closes the ring and produces the uh, the aldol here, or produces the en the enone here. Uh, and so, when you're when you're considering synthesis, you're gonna, gonna want to go back here and think about. And I I assigned a few synthesis problems quite a few on this one because this is kind of leading up to the end of all of our reactions. We only have one more reactions chapter left, I believe. Uh, and so we we have a lot of reactions in our head and a lot of possibilities. And so now's the real ch chance to, um, to test what you know about all of the reactions from organic chemistry and see if you can do these challenging synthesis problems. Uh, but it's all about looking at your product and seeing, well, how can I get there? What are the various reactions that will produce for me a molecule with this many carbon atoms, more or less than what I'm starting with, and a certain set of functional groups? And so familiarize yourself with the various functional groups that would be produced from each of these reactions so that you can quickly refer to them um, when, when you're performing your syntheses and kind of internalize them. I think at this point, synthesis are the most valuable uh, questions that you can do once you've 
uh, begun to learn these reactions because they help you to synthesize all the reactions you've learned into a single problem. So I hope that was helpful. I hope you have a great week and I will, uh, I will see you in class. Have a good one. Mm -hmm.